Well, I'd like to warmly welcome all of you this afternoon to AFSA uh, and to the American Foreign Service Association. My name is Susan Johnson. I'm the president of AFSA, and it's really a pleasure to have you all for this event, which is, uh, for me anyway, long awaited since uh, I've known Nick's been working on this book for some time. <laughs> I can tell you later how long that was. But this is the 15th event in AFSA's ongoing book note series which is designed to spotlight books of special interest to the Foreign Service community. And I think that we can all agree that today's selection is very much of interest uh, to all of us and to the diplomatic community more broadly, and in fact to others who are um, curious to know a little bit more about what diplomats are up to. So it's my real pleasure to welcome uh, the author, speaker, journalist, Nicholas Kraleff, to discuss his new book, America's Other Army the U.S. Foreign Service and 21st Century Diplomacy. Um, as many of you may know, if you know Nick, you know he was, was formerly a correspondent with Financial Times and the Washington Times, where he covered the State Department and political, foreign, and global affairs more generally. And in, that, uh, in those functions, he had the opportunity to fly all over the world with successive secretaries of state. During those travels, he met and spoke with hundreds of Foreign Service members worldwide, gaining a real and very special insight into the world of diplomacy and those who carry it out on behalf of the United States. Now, sort of as a twofer or a complement to his experience traveling, observing, and analyzing the practice of diplomacy, uh, Nick also became a business travel correspondent and later the founder and CEO of an air travel consulting and training company, Kraliff International LLC. And in that capacity, he published also another very useful book uh, on how to really make the most of, uh, I guess, travel the furthest in the most comfort for the least amount of money. Or <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, I, I just want to say a note here that, you know, we all of us, I'm sure, have been gripped by the recent tragic events in Benghazi, which illustrate, you know, all too starkly the risks and dangers inherent in the profession of diplomacy, and especially for diplomats of a nation such as ours committed to a global leadership role. So members of the Foreign Service understand and accept these inherent risks and dangers, and we all want the focus to be on reasonable and responsible risk management, not on sacrificing the mission in the name of zero risk. Nick's book provides a really vibrant and accurate description of what American diplomats do in carrying out our nation's foreign policy and advancing its interests. It effectively conveys the wide variety of duties performed and the strong sense of national service that permeates the small core of public servants known as the American Foreign Service. I was just having a sidebar conversation sort of comparing us with our military and sort of statistics as an order of mag magnitude, and I heard a new one, and that is that there are more colonels in our military than in the entire Foreign Service by a factor of seven, eight, ten, six. six. So just figure that one, just another little stat to sort of give you an idea. And one, one particular rank outnumbers uh, six times everybody in the Foreign Service, and that's everybody in the Foreign Service. So taking advantage of his job covering the State Department, um, I, as I mentioned, when Nick was traveling with the Secretaries of State, he watched what goes on in embassies, consulates, and other more remote locations and he tells the stories in a voice that's understandable to any audience. And I think this is one of the special uh, and very valuable characteristics of this book for us, because he can tell our story in an independent voice that's understandable to many of the people that we've often had less success uh, in describing clearly what it is we do and why it's important. Uh, so this, his book, America's Other Army, is carefully researched, insightful, and a very informative addition to a genre that's all too small, as we well know. So I think we are in for a very interesting discussion today. I hope you'll take the opportunity to get a copy of the book if you haven't done so beforehand. And uh, I want to just close by quoting partially from some uh, appraisal, uh, Deputy Secretary Bill Burns, who called Nick's book elegantly written, thoughtful, 
fair, and full of insights about our profession. So on that note, I think I can add my voice to recommend it highly to you and to turn the podium over to Nick to tell us about it. Thank you, Nick. I don't need them. Okay, I'm ready. Yep, we're all ready. Okay, I'm all jazzed up. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm blushing from this quote from Bill Burns and, and, and yours as well. Well, thank you very much for coming. I apologize for being sort of casual today, but I'm going to the airport to catch another flight. So I didn't want to be tired. First class. And, and, uh, of course. <laughs> well, this is a very different audience um, from the ones that I've been speaking to in the last couple of weeks. We had the CSIS premiere at, uh, here in a couple of weeks ago. Since then, I've been to Geneva, London, Amman, uh, Boston, Chicago, Dallas, um, and San something Francisco. I'm missing is that was, that was before oh, San Francisco was before in LA and, and, and several others in Seattle and Little Rock um, and I'm going to Asia tomorrow but I mean to, tonight so um, what I thought I would do is tell you more about how I came to this subject and why I decided to delve into it because not everybody covering the State Department over there decided to do what I did and then I will give you a, a glimpse of what I tell other audiences so this presentation is what I show others, and I wanted to do it this way because I've been asked several times now by people inside and outside the Foreign Service to give them the presentation, because apparently it's effective, and it does the job of explaining the Foreign Service to audiences that know, don't know much about it. But um, since uh, Susan mentioned uh, the events in Libya, for me, two things happened on September 11th this year. One is I became an American citizen. And two, thank you. And two, of course, um, the events in Benghazi. And as I do at every domestic event, I'd like to ask for your moment of silence in memory of the four Americans who died on September 11th. Thank you. I find it really a shame that only at a time of tragedy the media and the public seem to focus on the Foreign Service. And it's a very weird coincidence for me that the book came out shortly after the events in Benghazi, but I thought I would still use the opportunity uh, and try to um, educate people. So what happened to me was I went to the Kennedy School at Harvard and then worked for the Financial Times during that time and then a couple of years later. And I began covering the State Department, in fact, under, uh, at the end of Madeleine Albright and my first trip was with her. And then Powell came in, and about the time the Iraq war began, I thought to myself, so I've been to all these embassies and consulates with the secretary, and I've caught glimpses of what the Foreign Service does. But is that realistic, or is it superficial? Do I really see what's going on, or is it just all these posts preparing for the secretary to come and making sure that his visit goes as smoothly as possible? And the other question I had was, the Iraq war just began. I saw the run-up to the war with all the difficulties and complexities in the Security Council up in New York with all these resolutions. What is it like to be an American diplomat in, back then, 2003, or in the beginning of the 21st century? What happened to me personally, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, I was 15, and I was in Bulgaria, where I grew up. Up to that point, I wanted to be a theater director. But I figured in 89, in Bulgaria, all the theater was in the streets. Because for the first time in their lives, millions of people had the chance to express themselves freely. So then I decided to become a journalist and tell these stories and try to make sense of them and explain to the people of the country what the consequences of those events were. And in 19, I became a TV news reporter and, and had this interest in international affairs in particular, and through my first contacts at the American Embassy in Bulgaria, and uh, we have a former ambassador to Bulgaria here, Ken Hill, in the back, uh, whom I met after I left Bulgaria, but still, I'd, I'd see him on TV so many times when I was growing up, and, um, and also through my studies, I began to learn about the role that American diplomacy had played in ending the Cold War. So then years later, looking back on it, 
I thought, wait a second. Nothing of what's happened to me since then would have happened had it not been for that role that American diplomacy played in the end, ending the Cold War. I wouldn't have come to the US, wouldn't have gone to Harvard and become correspondent for these newspapers or written this book. So American diplomacy does have an impact on people's lives. Okay, well, what, what is it? What kind of impact is it? Does it affect more people than just me and the people in West, Central and Eastern Europe? So in 2003, I began researching what became an eight-part series in the Washington Times of the same name, America's Other Army. And through that research, which then grew into the book, I have three main questions of the people I interviewed. These visits to post were specifically for this purpose, but they were, they were not with the secretary. So I thought I wanted to see what life was like at post when the secretary wasn't there, or the, or the president wasn't there. And the first question I had was the one on the screen. Why should we care, the real people? Why should we care about diplomacy? Does it really affect us every day? Or is, is it this, I, what I call, the, most people see it as a stratosphere of officialdom that's practiced on some level that really real people cannot relate to. Because we see the, the diplomats in suits and ties on TV negotiating whether it will be with Iran or North Korea. And most people, I find, don't realize that what's happening behind the scenes does in fact affect their lives. The second question I had was, what is diplomacy in the, in the 21st century? Is it what it was 20, 30 years ago? Is it what we all perceive it is? Is it what the Foreign Service expected, or the members of the Foreign Service expected when they came in, particularly before 9-11? Or are there new duties being added to the Foreign Service tasks, and is the Foreign Service prepared for those? And the third question was, what do American diplomats actually do? Specifically, every day. That was the most difficult question to get answers to. And I asked this of every person I interviewed. It was a nightmare. I mean, it was like pulling teeth. The Foreign Service doesn't know how to be specific. <laughs> I don't like abstractions or generalizations. I wanted to tell, to humanize diplomacy. I wanted to, to demystify this profession and humanize the Foreign Service and diplomacy. And if I was going to do that successfully, I needed these stories and these faces and these people to tell me specifically what they do in human terms, not bureaucratic terms, human terms. So with all these questions in mind, and many more, of course, I went and visited 52 embassies and consulates without the Secretary of State. This was in addition to whatever I did officially. And interviewed about 600 members of the Foreign Service, mostly officers, but some specialists as well. And the last seven Secretaries of State. Well, I stand corrected. Seven minus Larry Eagleburger, which is so ironic because he was the only other so to become Secretary of State, but anyway. Okay, so I'll introduce, well, but you probably know some of those people, but for those who don't, I introduced to my audiences four of these 600, just to give people a very, very small glimpse, an example of what they've done, some of what they've done in their careers, just to give them a sense of the diversity and all the various tasks that are being asked of the Foreign Service today. And many of you probably know Cameron Manta, who just retired, but he was the ambassador to Pakistan. And I tell the story of uh, the Bin Laden raid, which he watched live, that he, there was a feed in Islamabad in addition to the ones here in, in Kabul. And then about having to not only explain to the Pakistani government why they had no idea that the foreign military operation was taking place in their, on their territory, but also to repair the relationship, which of course still is not repaired. And I also tell the story of when he was in Serbia, ambassador to Belgrade, and his embassy was attacked and set on fire, part of it, and then um, him getting intel that the person who ordered that attack, not ordered, but approved the attack, was the Prime Minister of Serbia, Vojislav Kustunica. And then Manter deciding to make sure every, to do everything in his power to make sure that the prime minister lost the next election, <laughs> which he did. But it was a very sophisticated behind-the-scenes operation involving the prime minister Zapatero of Spain and the future prime minister of Greece, George Pandreou, 
And many people tell me we're not interference in another country's domestic affairs. Well, welcome to the Foreign Service. <laughs> <laughs> the other uh, thing that I tell people, before he was in Serbia, he was the leader of a PRT in Iraq. In fact, he actually the first PRT, which was in Mosul. And of course, as many of the uh, PRTs did, he and his team had to basically teach the Iraqis in the province how to govern themselves. Build infrastructure from scratch, build hospitals and schools, set up a judicial system, pave roads and all these things, which of course he'd never done before in his life. And, but I explained that most people who, who've been through the PRTs, either in Iraq or Afghanistan, in fact haven't done any of the things they are supposed to teach the Iraqis or the, the Afghans how to do, but that's what you do in the Foreign Service, right? You need to learn it within days, and it, you learn it yourself because nobody's teaching it to you, and then you have to go and make it work in other countries. The second of the four is Yuri Kim, who is currently the political counselor in Ankara. And some of you may know her from the time she was uh, the assistant to Chris Hill. And before that, she was on the line if I, when I met her when Colin Powell, Secretary of State. And she spent, as you can imagine, a lot of time in the past year working with the Turks to get Bashar al-Assad to stop killing his own people in Syria. And uh, at the time, uh, Marta was dealing with the embassy on fire in Belgrade. She was in North Korea. She accompanied the New York Philharmonic in 2008 when they went for that concert. In fact, she negotiated that concert because Chris Hill was too high an official to be dealing with concerts. And of course, that concert, as you know, was a carrot for the North Koreans to do some things we wanted them to do on the nuclear front. The third of the four is David Linwall, who uh, was the political military counselor in Baghdad until this summer. And uh, as most political military sections do in, at every post, you know what they do? They deal with weapon sales, right? But it, it, it's interesting to outside people. What do you need to say about weapon sales weapons? Why is that? Before um, Baghdad, he was the DCM in uh, Port-au-Prince, and he managed the search for missing Americans after the earthquake. His, his house collapsed, and he's alive today only because he was at home. But of course, the CAO, the Cultural Affairs Officer at the Embassy, Victoria Devon, died because she was home when the, the earthquake happened. And before that, he was DCM in Guatemala, where one of the main things he at the Embassy did at the time was help reform the Guatemalan child adoption system. And that's interesting to, to outside people because they, they don't realize that American diplomats actually help reform child adoption systems or, or judicial systems. And uh, the reason the embassy got involved was that more Americans adopt children from Guatemala than from any other country but China and Russia. Guatemala's number three. And that system was so corrupt that the Americans were wasting thousands upon thousands of dollars on bribes. And of course, what does the average American do when they get frustrated from the government? They call their congressman, right? And then the Congress puts pressure on the Foreign Service, and that's what that's you have it. The embassy gets involved. But in fact, that effort was not as ambitious as another one I described in the book, which was the effort that the embassy in, in Santiago um, waged in the late 90s to reform the judicial system in Chile, which was a massive effort and very, very costly. But I didn't even know this. Chile didn't have trials. One judge decided everything. They had trials on appeal, but not until then. So I thought one of the interesting things the embassy did was bring down American architects so they can teach, they could teach the Chileans how to build courthouses. Because the Chileans didn't have to do it. They didn't have trials. Why did they need courthouses? And the last of the four is Gavin Sandwall, who I met in Beijing in 2003, where he was the chief of the American Citizen Services. And he told me this story about his first tour in Panama um, when he found himself sitting in a Panamanian jail across from two satanist killers. And of course he was there because they were American citizens and he had to make sure that they were treated according to the Vienna Conventions and all other um, standards. He was, just came back from Kabul where he was the um, information officer. And imagine to be the I.O. of the embassy at a time when an American soldier goes and kills 16 Afghan women and children, and then other soldiers were in the Quran. How do you fix public relations problems? So after this, this is what I summarize to, to audiences, and uh, they find it difficult to understand, because I, I found it difficult to understand back, back at the, the beginning of this. And so 
my logic was, how can all this, look at this, teaching effective governance, and of course, we, you, we all know that, that promoting American business is something that every embassy and consulate does every day of the year. So, teaching, teaching effective governance, nuclear negotiations, cultural events, reforming talent adoption systems and judicial systems, selling American weapons, recovering from natural disasters, promoting American business, issuing passports and visas, visiting prisoners and fixing public relations problems. How can this be part of one profession? I mean, is there any other profession that has all these duties on the list? And as you know better than me, we're not talking about specialists or experts, each of whom does one of these things. We're talking about you being able to do all of this, right? Because you never know what's going to come at you. You never know what kind of tour you need to, you, even if you're a political officer, but you might have to do a PD tour, right? Because it's better for your family. And your spouse is sick of Bujumbura and okay, when I was in another country like that, and it wants to go to Singapore or to Dubai, for example. So how do we make sense of all this? Do we, do we have people who need to be jacks of all trades? Do we need them to do all of this or half of this? My estimate is that the average FSO probably would have to do a third of this list. And of course, as you, this is a very partial list, right? I mean, I'm sure that you've done many things that are not on this list. But I just focus on these four people. So, to make sense of it, I went to the National Security Strategy. And this strategy of this White House, here's what it expects of the Foreign Service, if you haven't seen it. To help prevent conflict, spur economic growth, strengthen weak and failing states, lift people out of poverty, combat climate change and epidemic disease, and strengthen institutions of democratic governance. I, oh my God, how much money do you need to do this? How many people, how much time? I mean, is this humanly possible to do? Are we talking about changing the world? And why, why do we need to lift people out of poverty? Is it because we are nice? Because they need it? Well, there are many people that need, have needs in the world. But what's in it for us? How does it connect? Having being trained at the Kennedy School, in my mind, everything you did in foreign policy will have to go back to the national interest, right? You have to link it directly to that national interest. So what is the national interest? When I was first talking to Madeleine Albright before 9-11, there was no agreement in the two political parties, the main parties, about the national interest. The Democrats were saying, well, there are humanitarian interests that rise to the level of the national interest. That's why we got involved in Kosovo, for example. The Republicans were saying, no, 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 that's not national interest. National interest is national security. Well, since 9-11, actually, there's been agreement. And this current strategy defines the national interest as consisting of th these three components. The security of the United States, the prosperity of the country, and the values it stands for. And, for reasons that I don't need to explain to you, when you'll both the, the Secretary Clinton and Secretary Rice talk about this in the book extensively, they decided, actually the Bush administration decided, and this administration should follow through with this and continue it, that the only way for the United States to be truly secure and safe is for the entire world to be secure and safe. So, now everything is national interest, right? The same logic applies to prosperity. For the US to be truly prosperous, okay, maybe the world won't be prosperous in the next few thousand years, but at least... <laughs> If we have more countries with functioning economies and economic growth, then we'll be better off. And f I really feel for the people in the Foreign Service who, need, who actually work on this prosperity thing, because in the last few years it's been tough. I mean, how do you preach this to other countries when we have these problems at home? But they've still been doing it. So, going back to the mission of the Foreign Service, and trying to make sense of this, The QDDR, which I don't mean to <laughs> tell you what those letters mean, talks about the international system, right? And so both the strategy and the QDDR talk about this world that we seek. So the world that's more stable and prosperous that doesn't exist yet. But that's, they, they call it the world, that's the world we seek. And so we want the Foreign Service to help bring that world about. And you haven't forgotten, I'm sure, that Condi Rice used to call that transformational diplomacy. I actually have been using this term, and um, Susan had some 
if not objections, wasn't very mm. comfortable with it because of the because it, it was politicized. And and you and I understand why. Condi Roy says that it was never about transforming other countries in the US image. It was never about imposing democracy. It was about good governance. And I'll get to that in a second. But the, the QDDR and the national security strategy both recognize the world as it is. And also say we need to deal with it. And of course, what tools do we have at our disposal to deal with the world as it is? Well, diplomacy, right? That's what traditional diplomacy does. And so that's how I constructed the mission of the Foreign Service, even though it wasn't told to me this way, but in that's what I decided in my mind was the mission of the Foreign Service. To deal with the world as it is and help to bring about a more secure and prosperous world so the United States can be more secure and prosperous. I wanted one sentence. The answers I was getting when I asked this question was, oh, we advanced a positive agenda. What? <laughs> <laughs> I know what teachers do and I know what doctors do, but diplomats advance a positive agenda? At the end, people say, well, it depends. Well, I want a sentence of what you do. Don't tell me it depends. Then others will say, well, we represent the United States. Okay, that's a bit more specific, but still, how? What do you do to represent the United States every day? Go to parties? Because that's what pe most people think when you say that. And in, I tell this to people, which I don't have to tell you, but in classic diplomacy, the, the core functions, the managing foreign relations, and there I talk about, just to give you an idea, and this, this is, you haven't seen this before, so um, here I talk about the cable writing and reporting, I talk about uh, the, the basically the, the daily business of the United States that needs to be taken care of, and the second, representing the, the US and its people, right? People, not only the country. And then assisting American citizens in various capacities, and lastly, multilateral diplomacy. And then the transformational part of this, as I said, all about good governance. Conby Rice talks about this in the book. Secretary Clinton talks about this in the book. And so the question is, because I always ask, you know, I'm told something and then ask why. Why are we doing this? How does it make sense? Do we need to do it? Do these people need to be there at those embassies? Can they do this from here? Right? Do we need to pay for their moving expenses and housing and children's education? So, in transformational diplomacy, all about good governance. And what does that mean? And I feel like I shouldn't be preaching and teaching because, because you know, most of you know this, but from, from where I sit, from outside the Foreign Service, Good governance is about responsible and accountable governments, right? That respect their people's rights, provide basic services, water, food, electricity, and also provide economic opportunity. Because, as Condi Rice says in the book, we never thought we would have to worry about the fifth poorest country in the world. But, if you have a government that is not accountable and responsible, doesn't provide economic opportunity, then these people, if they have no job to go to, will turn to other means to feed their families. And that's how they might turn to crime, even terrorism, and that affects us. <clears throat> the resources. So now I ask the, the beginning, well, how, what do you need to do all this? To, because it's, it, it, it just sounds like it's about changing the world, right? You, do, you need to deal with the world as it is. God knows there are so many things to worry about and all these crises have come at you. But this other mission, so the resources. 2011, 53 billion, right? The biggest budget ever in the history of the country for, for the State Department and, and international programs, including foreign aid, which was 35 billion, less than 1% of GDP, right? And then the human resources, 13,000. Brenda here didn't want to be famous, but Brenda Greenberg from HR actually was the one who gave me the numbers, and I thank her for that. She didn't want to be quoted in the book, and I haven't done that, but, um, but she was very helpful with all these numbers and other things from HR. Not that everything about HR in the book is positive. <laughs> 
So 30, about 13,000, 8,000 FSOs and 5,000 specialists. Military. It was actually $640 billion last year. So about 12 times more. And the members, the 1.4 million members are just the active duty members of the DM for, uh, services. That, that doesn't include reservists or civil service personnel in uh, here at the Pentagon. So, the, the, as you know, there has been a debate about how much the military should play a role in this whole good governance transformational thing that, that is supposed to be going on. And it's been the subject of a couple of books as well. So before I take your questions, I wanted to talk about two trends that I noticed in the Foreign Service. The first one has to do also with one of the techniques that I used to make the book more interesting. And it was the humanizing thing that I mentioned at the beginning. So I wanted to write a book that wasn't academic, that was accessible, as Susan said, and I'm glad that she thinks that it's understandable to anyone, and a book that keeps you reading it rather than falling asleep on it. The first technique I used was to show the explicit direct link between what you do and national security or the national interest. And the second was humanizing and demystifying the profession. I didn't want to glorify the Foreign Service or denigrate it or criticize it or judge it too much. I wanted to show what I saw and what I thought was going on. So balance and objectivity was important to me. But in that humanizing that I was trying to use in telling the stories, I also noticed that humanizing has been already taking place in the Foreign Service in the last few years. And I actually discovered three aspects of it. The first one, in the Foreign Service itself. And you've, you've seen the incoming A100 classes, right? You've seen the diversity, not necessarily ethnically, which is still, the, the Foreign Service is still 80% white. 40% now are women, which is a big difference, of course, from 20, 25 years ago, but it's 80% still white. 5% black only, and 7% Asian. The diversity is more in background and experience, right? And as you know better than me, there's been this effort to, to make the Foreign Service a bit more human or more accommodating, right? There were, there were all these rules that Torian Newland talks in the book about taking maternity leave, how difficult that used to be. And that when she wanted to take it twice in less than 18 months, HR looked at her like she didn't have a head on her shoulder. The second aspect I found had to do with other countries, opening up American diplomacy to, to foreign publics. And the secretary calls that people-to-people -people diplomacy, right? And the logic is that you don't, it's not enough anymore to do diplomacy on a government-to-government -government level, but you need to do people-to-people, -people, and you also need, as a, as a US government, to have access directly to foreign audiences overseas, because, I think no, Newland says that in the book, even in countries that are not democracies, public opinion matters. And that's why all this effort now, look at IAP, what is IAP doing? They're not working on speaker programs that much, they're working on social media. I was stunted to discover a few weeks ago an ad for a job at IAP, social media something specialist, the salary was insanely high. I couldn't believe that. It was. Seventy-five hundred thousand dollars to the social media at IAP. I yeah, that I was surprised by that. But the third aspect is opening up American diplomacy to the American public, and that's the one that is not entirely clear to me yet. The secretary wants Americans to have opportunities to contribute to American diplomacy. It's easier through the private sector, obviously, but how can private Americans contribute is still not very clear to me. I, there, there is an office at state that's supposed to be thinking about this. Obviously, social media is being used, but I think there is great potential in that, but I don't think it's been fleshed out. And of course, it's up to the next Secretary of State to see how that might happen. And the last thing that I will mention, the last trend, 
that I call identity crisis, the Foreign Service Identity Crisis. So, and, and you, um, most of you I'm sure will relate to this, but Mike Hammer, who is the Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs currently, was talking about the fact that those of you who came before 9-11 came with a certain perception of diplomacy and a certain expectation of what you would be doing. And after 9-11, suddenly you asked to do more, and then more, and then more, and then more. Good governance, fine. But then these PRTs, that was different, right? Almost no training, no Arabic, a day and a half of shooting in West Virginia, and that was pretty much it, right? <laughs> so he talked about how that challenged the identity of the Foreign Service, and how it was a shock to the system. Obviously, during Vietnam and after the, the Vietnam War, that generation did some of that, in a way. But those people are really not in the Foreign Service anymore. And it wasn't quite the same. So, um, another person in the book says, I'm being asked to go to Iraq and talk to village elders about how to dig wells. I don't like about digging wells. I've never done it in my life. There might be better value to my government in that capacity than being a public diplomacy officer, which I've been for 25 years. It's a good question. If you want, if, if the government or the, your leaders want you to do all these new things, what's the cost and benefit? How much do they need to spend on, you know, to invest in your training, which actually doesn't happen anyway, but if, the, if it were to happen, is that a better expenditure of human and financial resources than, than have you do what you've been doing since you joined the Foreign Service, or at least in the areas in which you've been working. So the, that's why this last point about the training, you know, I have a whole chapter called Teaching Diplomacy, because I, I'm really still interested in this. I don't believe that anyone anywhere in this country, schools, Georgetown, Fletcher, I don't think they teach you how to be a diplomat. They teach you regional studies, IR, general things. But the profession of diplomacy is just not being taken seriously outside the Foreign Service. Look at how many people think diplomacy is easy, right? Anyone can do diplomacy. Angelina Jolie can do it, and she's actually done not a bad job. I mean, she, she's doing great things, but that's not the point. The point was, is that to be a diplomat, you need to be trained as a diplomat and to have experience. And the whole issue with, I'm, there probably will be a question about political ambassadors, but, and there is, there is a chapter about this, but I found among most of you, your, your issue is not having political ambassadors in the system. Your issue is selecting those people based on experience and skills, right? Which doesn't happen. They're not selected based on that. They're selected on other criteria and we know what they are. But FSI, I was very lucky to be given access. I spent um, some time over a few weeks at FSI 100 and then the, um, uh, the poll, uh, the poll econ class, the console class, not all of it, but anyway. And I think they, they've improved greatly. I have the catalog at home, it's this thing. But the big picture is what I'm missing still. And as many people in the book talk about, strategic thinking is not encouraged in the Foreign Service today. Right? Because the, the mantra is we're more operational now. We need to take care of business. A good FSO is who? They're someone who can get things done, right? Make things happen, not necessarily think strategically. Well, and then the other thing that Bill Burns says in the book is that the Foreign Service perversely prides itself on being able to adapt and improvise. And so clearly improvisation is big in the Foreign Service, as I don't have to tell you that, but it's, I don't want to judge too much, but I, maybe that improvisation thing is a bit too much. <laughs> the, I mean, obviously so many things are thrown at you and you can't predict many times what, what will happen and, you know, people ask me all the time, well, when they come in with, through the, you know, the entrance process, how do they select them? And, and people from recruitment tell me, well, they need this very, very um, diverse pool of people. And 30 years ago, most people coming into the service actually did have some background in travel, but today, most of them actually don't, as you know. So... And you throw them, and people in the book talked about being thrown in a pool and having to learn how to swim. 
because nobody's teaching you that. And I know it's difficult because if you are not jacks of all trades, then what's the alternative? Experts, right? Specialists. But the problem with that is you don't know when you might need certain expertise for how long, right? And where. So it, you have to make a decision that clearly they have made the decision to bring in a diverse pool of people. But what surprised me was you take someone who's never had any experience in this and they have A100, which, or you know, all, it's all training, really. It's orientation, right? That's what they call it anyway. <coughs> you get the cable writing class, and I talk to people who've done the, that. They go to their first post and they have to write a cable. Turns out it's nothing like what they get taught in ever at FSI. <laughs> this professional development that, that, that Colin Powell talked about in, in the book and at the time he was Secretary of State, I don't see that being fleshed out yet. I don't see that happening in terms of training people how to be diplomats. Having a good boss, obviously, is probably the best thing that can happen to any first tour officer, right? Well, yeah, but they're very good bosses in the foreign service, but also, as you know, they're very bad ones. In fact, the story I tell um, frequently, I was in Sudan a few years ago, and the Cherche there praised the poll counselor and said she was the best political officer he'd ever seen in his life. I went to Beijing two weeks later, and the DCM there happened to know the political counselor in Sudan. He told me she was the worst he ever saw. <laughs> What, what criteria do people use? How can the same yeah. person be the best and the worst for different people? So that's the, the unpredictability of the, of the career path, the, the lack of professional development, because I think it is still lacking, that's what surprised me. And the, the chapter four of the book is called Looking in the Mirror, and that's sort of the critique. It doesn't come from me, it comes from the inside. Um, I've tried to, again, make sense of it and, and analyze it and present it in a way that people can understand and, and, and to be easily accessible. But I guarantee you, for people on the outside, it's very surprising that American diplomats really don't get trained how to be diplomats. That they expect you to, in a way, come in with it. In fact, as someone says in the book about Bill Burns, Bill Burns is a good FSO not because the institution made him that, because he came whatever was in his DNA. And that's, the, of course, the case with many people. If you happen to have good bosses, several of them, then maybe that helped you as well. But should that be enough? Maybe, maybe, it should, maybe I should just shut up and just say, well, this is what it is, and figure it out as you go, and improvise, and it's, right? So far, it wasn't the Foreign Service's fault that Benghazi, the concept was attacked, right? Um, so that's really the, the, my final thought is, does anything need to change? Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, <laughs> you said it. <laughs> but then politically, and then, you know, think about this, politically, a sweeping reform is difficult because there is no Secretary of State that comes in and knows for certain that they'll be here more than four years, right? Nobody knows they'll be here around for eight years. So they look at the job and say, okay, I'm supposed to be the CEO of the State Department. I'm supposed to be the COO, because I'm also the chief diplomat of the country. And I'm also the president's chief foreign policy advisor. Well, these are three jobs, really. All the other cabinet secretaries in this town are see, that's CEOs. That's all they do. But I have three hats. And I have four years. And I have all these crises. I'm not going to start reforming the Foreign Service, because I'm not going to complete it. Right? And then... Talk to HR. I don't think HR thinks that they, there's a need for sweeping reforms. I think they think they can adapt and adjust, but things are fine. That, that's my impression. I may be wrong, but that's my impression. So let me, yeah, right. So let me um, end here. And uh, before I take your questions, if anyone is going to Virginia after this, I can use the right to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> national airport, not Dallas, national. Anyway. Um, so I'll end with that, and um, um, I'm trying to start a program on the practice of diplomacy, not the study of diplomacy. There are many of those, but on the practice of diplomacy. And I'm looking at different options. Uh, one option is to, to base it at an existing think tank, and the other option is to, and, and, and then with the potential of spinning off into its own thing. 
but in any case, you can uh, read more about it and, and about the book at americas.army.com. And when you read the book, you can submit comments so people outside the Foreign Service can see them on the website or on Amazon, whatever you want. Well, thank you very much, and I'm ready for questions. Do you want to say something? Can you give me the premier honor of, like, dean of the uh, <laughs> And they always say I need to do, oh, no microphone. Really? Oh, I'm just... Oh, there's one back. coming. Here's there, one it's here. coming. Okay. Thank you. Hi, and thank you very much for your insightful analysis of the Foreign Service. I'm Tommy Grant, and I know I'm going to give a plug to the Civil Service Association since I'm president of it. And Susan is uh, one of our, or is our senior advisor. While you were talking, I'm thinking this guy knows exactly what he's talking about, which is great. He, he's got a good. It's a, it, it's good for outsiders to take a look at the Foreign Service. I was former former, former Foreign Service long ago in the 60s. Uh, Papa Doc and I probably didn't see eye to eye. Really. But here's the thing: the Foreign Service has done more to transform America. I think you get an A plus because look at America today through adoptions and through immigration. We have a different, and this is what the political, I think, climate is all about, what, what does our America look like and what do we want our America to look like? And so if you want to see how effective foreign service officers are, or in my case, do you want to see how effective diplomats are, whether they're foreign service or civil service serving abroad, look at the policies that we have followed over the last, what, half century and how we have been instrumental in transforming even our own diplomatic systems here. Yes. You can, can you pass the mic right here at the front? Yeah, and then we'll go. Oh. Yeah. Be sure the microphone is on. My name is George Mihaias. I'm from my uh, new foundation. I got set up in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to you. And, uh, yes, I do. It's why. Uh, may I just give a uh, witness? The last four months in Romania, what the American Embassy Ambassador uh, Dieterstein did, uh, one could write maybe several books. I hope you write a book. You just cost the Danube from Bulgaria, Bulgaria. but uh, American Embassy, the Ambassador, saved Romania. I followed this the first time. I put Romania as a political. Did the country. Romanians agree? many of them, and they do need, uh, I just sent someone late in Romania, but just to document the facts, what happened, because they were almost in a coup d'etat, right. you know, and the way Americans handled this was not obvious, I understand the handicaps, training, and so on, but just to document what the Ambassador Peter Stein and American Embassy and how they mobilize others, including the Europeans, including the European Union. You may know that Philip Gordon, uh, Gordon went there in last August. So this is a strategic partner of America, uh, NATO, uh, member of European Union, and so on. Yet the work done by the ambassador and this embassy deserves a whole book about it. So I, I think I can relate to what you said, and I would invited to write a book about just what happened in Romania because this is in making, in preparation of what is going to happen in many other countries where America promotes uh, democracy, development, government. We don't have the words about this. Now, uh, in that Can we go to a question because there are other people question, and I need to go to the airport. Uh, so. <laughs> how are you going to, with whom? and how we can follow about your idea about the uh, center on the practice of diplomacy? Well, obviously to start we need grants and donations, uh, but um, I'll, there is a, and on, the, on this website the, the mission and the, the um, objectives and the strategy are all there, so please go and um, you can see all that on americasatarmy.com. Uh, yes? Hi, uh, my name is Paul Fritsch. Uh, by way of background, I'm coming back to the Foreign Service after having served in uh, senior positions with international organizations for the past 11 years. Uh, so I, I bring a particular perspective on the changes that have occurred over that period of time, having seen them and sort of experienced them in part, but having maintained a certain distance as well. 
um, also having served uh, side by side with members of other diplomatic services around the world um, and, and being able to compare uh, what, what we've done with what others have done. Um, I'm a bit troubled by a definitional question and your distinction between traditional and transformational diplomacy. Uh, because as I understood uh, tra transformational diplomacy, the term in the Kandi Rice politicized version, um, it, it involved, um, it, it, it was diplomats taking off the suits, getting out into the field, building the wells, uh, doing non-traditional things. When I think of traditional diplomacy, I think of George Kennan, I think of, of the Marshall Plan, I think of, of the people who built the United Nations and NATO. I, I think of people who did things to create the world that we want, and, and we're not necessarily limiting themselves to the world as it, as it is or what. Um, and I've had to wonder, um, as we've seen this, this dramatic transformation in what Foreign Service officers are asked to do over the course of a normal career span, have we lost something? Uh, have, we, have we lost the ability to achieve those transformations using the tools of traditional diplomacy? You, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation uh, the efforts at the beginning of the Iraq War at the United Nations Security Council. Um, whatever one thinks of the policy of, of invading Iraq, um, it, things could have gone a lot smoother for those people who were eventually going to be in the DRTs if we had been able to put in a little bit more effort in New York, in Paris, in, in Berlin, in, uh, in Moscow, in building that consensus in a more traditional diplomatic way. Uh, and I'm wondering if uh, you explore um, whether something is going missing and whether something essential in, in the diplomatic mission is going missing as, as we go down this path of transforming ourselves into uh, sort of global handymen. Well, there's certainly people in the book asking those questions as well. I'm not giving the answers because I don't think we know the answer yet. We don't know what might have been lost because of what you're describing, or how, how less effective has the Foreign Service been in classic diplomacy because of the diversion, or whatever you call it, that you know, you'd have to go and do this new thing. I think the jury's still out. There, obviously, there are many people you won't be surprised who think that um, it would have been better if the focus hasn't, hadn't been shifted, and then, you know, we actually Susan in the, it's quoted in the book about talking about traditional diplomacy and saying that it's really not a boogeyman. It's there and you know it's it's very useful because in many parts of the world that's all they know. That's how they operate. And they the the, the question I'm uh, often asked is, well okay, the US goes and tries to prom promote and, and help other countries practice good governance, but do the other countries want that? And then the other question is, so we're doing this because we think it's good for us, ultimately through these, you know, connecting the dots and all that, but is it good for the countries where we want to, to have good governance? Some countries don't think it is, and some countries, as you know, still operate on the zero-sum game basis, and they think it's good, if it's good for the Americans, it must be bad for us. But ultimately, but I think that the, ultimately the jury's still out on, you know, if and how much has been lost because of the shift to focus. Yes? Hello, um, I'm Gabriel. I'm in the Public Affairs uh, Diplomacy Center. And my question is in regards to the politicization uh, that we have in regards to sort of how do we deal with um, the statement that was issued in Cairo uh, right before the um, storming of our embassy there, you know, when we were protesting outside. But then it got brought into the U.S. politics and uh, politics world and where, you know, the ambassador had to then recall uh, that statement later on. But how does the mm -hmm. FSI or FSOs seek to deal with a more politicized world in which what they're doing in the field abroad can easily now be brought back into the U.S. and demagogued by both sides? Pro I don't want to be prescriptive, but probably by knowing better about how Washington works. I mean, Larry Schwartz knows because he served in D.C. a long time, and he was the guy who apparently understand wrote that statement, or at least approved it. So he's the PO in uh, in Cairo. It's Larry Schwartz, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So and, and you have to you have to most people don't think about this because it's not doesn't happen very often. But in election year, with debates coming up, you have to assume that this might be used. 
against whoever, and you are in the middle of it. But how do you deal with it? Uh, some people ask whether he should resign or whether he should be fired. Well, he wasn't, and he didn't, because that's not how the Foreign Service works, right? He's there, he has his tour, and unless he does something demonstrably wrong and anti-policy, then he would be disciplined, but he wasn't, because in this case, apparently, he wasn't deemed of having done anything that wrong. He's been quiet, which probably is a good idea, <laughs> after this. Um, and um, to me, ultimately, is it's not only the, 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 the public that I think should know more about the Foreign Service. I think the political leaders of this country should, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No presidential candidate com coming into office knows enough about the Foreign Service. They don't. Even the ones that are well-traveled and well-educated, they don't. I'm not sure, well, actually, I'm sure. Be because they, they have so much work, I mean, look at how many things the president has to deal with. I wish he had more time to actually learn about how the Foreign Service operates. Because ultimately, these changes that we're talking about, they're not going to come from inside, right? They, they'll have to come from the leadership, whether it's the secretary or the president. This whole strategic thing, that's not really for the Foreign Service to decide, or, and, and, if it, and it probably won't. But until the president, any president, or any presidential candidate knows not only the Foreign Service sacrifices and that you know you go to work every day and, and just by going to work you risk your lives, but but down when it comes down to it, how do you do your job? What are you supposed to do? What do you do with those embassies? And of course the easiest thing to do that is to read my book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Stephanie Kinney, um, retired Foreign Service officer. Um, two things. One, I wonder if you have drawn any conclusions or um, observations about the potential for real definition and robust institution when that institution is, uh, does not have a coherent culture. Um, it has two personnel systems which are radically different. One, I personally think, is better suited to the 21st century challenges. Um, this is no reflection on the people in either. Uh, we're talking about the personnel system and the cultures that flow from that. Uh, and is it possible to have a strong, in effect, foreign ministry um, with a divided culture, number one? Um, and number two, thank you very much for focusing on the, de the definition, the definitional issue um, I wonder um, if we could get to a commonly understood and conveyed first at the institutional level, then you can go to the people and to the politics, um, uh, how one goes about forming that curriculum or that uh, agreed upon core knowledge of which you speak that I think you're completely correct uh, has disappeared and is part of our problem. There is no grand strategy when you're being turned into a program at, uh, uh, agency for operations. Right. Well, the second is a very complex question, and, and um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to be um, highly paid as a consultant to answer it. <laughs> 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 no, it's really, I couldn't even begin in, 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 a, in a few minutes. So it's just, it, pro it may be another book, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but on the first question, um, yes, I um, got the impression that most people in the building do have a problem with the two, the two systems and think they're not working together, the civil service and foreign service. What do you do about it? I think we go back to the leadership. Is this going to coexist for the foreseeable future? If not, what's the alternative? What do we do with the Foreign Service Act? I mean, it's 1980. That was when the Foreign Service Act was adopted. It, you know, this was before Ronald Reagan. So a lot, a lot of things have changed since then. But again, as Susan pointed out, um, either in the book or some through other means, we, you know, if you were to look at the Foreign Service Act, you then you have this incredibly arduous and difficult task of coming up with something new and better, because you don't want to spoil something that at least is working, right? You don't want to get something worse than what you already have. And so, 
in, in trying to reform the Forest Service Act or, or to have a new act, you, you, I mean, you need a multi-year effort here, right? You, need, you probably will have to cross over administrations, you need the support on the Hill, in the, you need both the foreign and the civil service, so it would be a very, very huge effort to do that. But my impression is that most people I talk to don't believe that the, 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 the civil service and the foreign service personnel system are working well. There, there, it's a divided culture. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So we have two. Okay, we have two more. Let's do, and then we'll do the gentleman with the glasses. And um, yeah. I'm seeing people leaving, and they want to buy a book, but they can't because I'm not there, and my assistant <laughs> is sick today. He would typically I'll, will do the I'll sales. Here, here, but, um, but anyway, so I don't want to lose customers. <laughs> <laughs> don't yes. Don't question to interrupt the book sale. No, 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 please. <laughs> Ted McNamara, retired FSO. I'm want to call into question the, the division between traditional diplomacy yes. and transformational diplomacy. Yes. I really think that that's a, a artificial and b historically inaccurate. Uh, someone pointed out that uh, George Kennan and, and that generation, traditional diplomacy. Uh, George Kennan and the Marshall Plan was transformational diplomacy. Uh, not only did they, uh, in effect, that generation uh, handled the Bretton Woods Conference, the establishment of the United Nations, all of which were traditional diplomacy. But the Marshall Plan, in fact, went out and uh, put money in the hands of uh, people who were handling refugees, because there were millions of refugees in Europe at the time. Uh, I could go on. Right, but put, the, put, put the money in their hands, but was it there and alongside them actually in boots doing that? That's the question. That's the difference, right? That's, what, that's at least what, what's being described as different. Not just giving them the money, yes, but being there model, with them. No, no, no. Which they model were there better? on the ground. Right, they right. They were there on the ground. Oh, wait, that's a good question. Which model were better? Yeah, is it, was, yeah. was it that one or this one? Marshall Plan Europe or, or post transformation? Right, good, good, good question. How about moving one generation <laughs> Another book. beyond that to the generation just before I came in when uh, Africa was transformed uh, chiefly by Western diplomats and among the Western diplomats, American diplomats, who actually created the governments. Uh, hand in hand with the presidents and the prime ministers of these governments and the British and French uh, who had been there as colonial powers transforming uh, the government. So the the, it, it isn't that 21st century didn't develop and uh, invent transformational diplomacy. I was in the next generation and you saw exactly what went on in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Iraq was going on in Vietnam. And we've had about the same amount of success in both cases, as a matter of fact. Uh, but but in, we were doing the things in the 1960s and the, uh, in, the in, in Vietnam that we were doing in, in Iraq in 19 uh, in 2006, 7, and 8. So I don't see that difference. And and as one who spent time in Africa and Latin America, as well as in the Soviet Union elsewhere, uh, I saw transformational diplomacy practiced it in Colombia when we turned the government around. With what? Uh, rewrote the Colombian Constitution. Uh, rewrote the Colombian uh, system of judicial practice. Back, this was back in, uh, in 89 and 90, before the Cold War was over. So uh, it's, it's an interesting concept, but I'm not sure that you have uh, really identified something that's different, new, or... The difference, the difference is the that they're now, they're now saying, and this is, I didn't invent any of this, okay? This was, this is based on interviews. This is not, I didn't serve in Iraq, I visited, but I didn't serve. So, um, you can argue with Condi Rice and Hillary Clinton and Anne-Marie Slaughter, so please do. But, um, the, the point is that, the, that, um, back then, the argument is, I, I, as I was um, told it, that this was a more episodic than it's now. That now it's become, becoming more of the mainstream, um, and it's not just something that you do in Vietnam, which is one country in the world, because we had the responsibility after the, you know, the, the war. But this is something that we're not doing only in Afghanistan and Iraq and Pakistan, we're doing in Africa. And the other difference is that now development is so much part of diplomacy, they're not separated anymore. It's now development is part and parcel of diplomacy. Well, then why did Hillary Clinton have to have this initiative? And, 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 and you know, so you're talking about every secretary of state comes in and, and wants to have her own thing, right? 
It's the old NIH syndrome, yeah. not, not invented, invented here. here. <laughs> Therefore, you change it. And uh, right. who ever heard of stupid power? So you want smart power. <laughs> Give us a break. Can you print new I mean, There really isn't much new it's under repackaging. It's uh, repackaging. It's really being done before. Re because you don't know anything about it operationally and historically, or you want to give the appearance of something new. Yeah, I, I disagree a little bit. I, I think this has been going on since the 1960s and 1970s. But As the book says, on, by the way. It yeah. is going on alongside other things. And what's happened as resources have gotten more tight is that we've eliminated more and more of those other things and left this as the core mission of the Department of State. And I'm, I'm not sure that the national interest has been strengthened as a result. Yeah. And this, this goes back to the question of what, what's getting lost. What are we sacrificing to transform ourselves yep. into a, a muscular so, AID? So we're sacrificing the traditional, the core. Right, that's what he was saying when he was yeah. Because it's elite. The that's reporting, the analysis. Elite. Right. Being our government's agent vis-a-vis yeah. -vis other got, countries. And you've got a residual holdover of people of Cameron Munter's generation. Uh, well, not him anymore. Uh, right. Now he's gone, unfortunately. Um, but who can do both? I mean, who were brought in with the traditional skill set and who had to make this adjustment on the fly uh, mid-career. Mid but now we're recruiting people, um, not based on on what traditional diplomacy, diplomatic skills, what traditional diplomacy is. And I right. really wonder where we're headed with that. And I'm not, the, the argument in the book isn't that this is new. I'm just explaining what the Foreign Service does. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that, that this happening that doesn't mean it didn't happen before. And, and I mean, I talk about Vietnam two or three times in the book, with in quoting people who say, well, this is what they, sort of what they did in Vietnam, not exactly the same because you've got different countries, that, you know, decades apart. But um, I had another um, retired officer uh, who read a few chapters a few months ago and said, well, the you know, political officers are saying things here that sound like this is, this is new, but we did this in the 70s. So yeah, I, I understand that, but I don't need that conflict because that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to contrast the new with the old and say, well, this is new and that's, you know, great, Hillary invented something or can't invent something. I'm just explaining, making sense of what the Foreign Service does and why it does it. And so the fact that I quote Condi Rice and Hillary Clinton are because they were recent and they were still around, and um, you know people who were Secretary of State before Kissinger were not around. So, but anyway, and, and I do need to write a current book in 2012, right? <laughs> and we have yes, the let's go. Thank you. Um, that doesn't have really to be the last question. Yeah, short question. Um, I the numbers you said with uh, 13,000 actually look pretty big for me. I'm from one of the smallest foreign service agencies. USDA and with FSO there. So I'm curious whether you talked with FSOs with the other foreign service agencies, or whether this was just to look at uh, what the State Department does in this area. Um, FCS uh, and FAS. That's right. Yes, I do, yes, chapter six. Sorry, chapter five. <laughs> chapter five. <laughs> Economic and business diplomacy. Yes, I do talk about these two. People ask me, well, do you talk about the CIA? Well, no, I don't. Because the CIA is not part of the Foreign Service. They may be at embassies, but they're not part of the Foreign Service. Uh, but yes, the, the Agricultural and co Commercial Service, yes. And of course, USAID. Um, well, great. Well, thank well, you, you very much. Okay. Well, thank you.